Uh, I'm Carl Indefirth. I'm the Wadwani Chair in U.S. India Policy Studies here at CSIS. And I am uh, very privileged to have with us um, and introduce this morning our guest speaker, Mr. Bala Subramanian Bhutaraman, um, who is Vice Chairman Tata Steel and Chairman of Tata International. Um, I should mention that um, he will be speaking today as part of our Emerging India Economy Signature Series. And I think that we have copies of this report available, if you do not already have it, um, in the back here. So he will be speaking, uh, looking at the, um, as I said, the Emerging India Economy Series. His remarks will be on India's budget, uh, economy, and the 2014 elections. I think that gives him a broad canvas with which in he can uh, take whatever portions of that you wish to speak on. I should mention that he'll be speaking in his personal capacity, uh, not as um, a representative of Tata Steel or Tata International, but of course I feel confident that his remarks will be, um, uh, will be certainly informed by his uh, experiences uh, working uh, in these areas. Before he begins, let me call attention to a couple of uh, recent news items to set the stage for this discussion. Um, the first one is a Reuters piece last week, which was entitled, India Economy to Remain Subdued. Um, this was a Reuters poll of economists. So it's to remain subdued. I think that that's um, subdued would be better than stalled. I think that's where the U.S. economy is, um, or better than submerged, which is, I think, where some of our European friends' economies are. But anyway, it says it will be um, subdued, and I'll just read you what this um, report said, that economists polled for the latest quarterly survey lowered their growth forecast for India's third largest economy for the eighth consecutive time. Uh, gross domestic product will increase 6.0% in the current fiscal year to March 2014 after it grew at a decade low of 5% in the previous fiscal year, according to this forecast of 27 economists. And they said that weak demand for Indian goods and services abroad has been a major factor in the slowdown in addition to lack of policy initiatives from the government. So that's what we're hearing from the Reuters poll. Now, on a more positive, upbeat note, uh, as many of you know, Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh has uh, just concluded a trip to Germany in a meeting with uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel. And during his uh, trip to Berlin, um, India and Germany set a target of concluding the long-awaited India-EU free trade agreement this year notwithstanding a number of unresolved issues, it says. It said that um, both leaders, uh, Manmohan Singh and Angela Merkel, uh, said that the uh, free trade agreement will generate jobs and growth in both countries and that they hope for this to be concluded in 2013. Um, I should add here, uh, as we know, Angela Merkel has a certain reputation these days for austerity and some of her European friends sometimes wish that she would sort of lighten up a bit. She did say at this meeting um, uh, with the Prime Minister that she uh, said um, she candidly advocated that the two sides do have difficulties to overcome, and she pressed for an increase in the foreign equity cap in India's insurance sector and reduction in tariffs on import of automobiles from Europe. Uh, I think that that's uh, par for the course with uh, the Chancellor. Uh, she does candidly advocate a lot of economic measures. But the fact is that it does appear that um, this uh, free trade agreement is moving forward and one that I hope, uh, as we have written on here at CSIS, uh, that the U.S. will be able to start orienting itself to, over the longer term, a uh, free trade agreement with India. Now, uh, we have for you on the table, outside as well, the um, full bio for our speaker. Uh, let me just mention uh, very quickly in terms of, by way of background, uh, that um, our speaker joined Tata Steel in 1966. And if I'm not mistaken, 
Tata has operations in 26 countries, is that correct? A little more. Um, commercial presence in more than 50 countries. Am I getting closer? Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, obviously a major international um, concern uh, that reaches around the world. He has held various positions, including vice president of both marketing and sales and the cold rolling meal projects. Uh, in addition, uh, he serves on the boards of Bosch India Limited, Tata Industries, and Strategic Energy Technology Systems. He also served, and we talked about this on our way down, as president of the Confederation of Indian Industry, CII, from 2011 through 2012. Um, we are close partners with CII and much of what we do here at CSIS. And uh, last year, uh, he received, he was uh, received from the government of India, the prestigious Padma Bhushna Award for his significant contribution to Indian trade and industry. A congratulations and a well-deserved award for his lifetime work and achievement in this field. So, uh, as I said, it's our privilege uh, and honor to have you with us, and I would now like to turn it over to our speaker for his remarks, and then we will have a interactive discussion following that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm sure my mother would have been extremely happy to hear all that you told about me. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon to everybody. And uh, I want to thank all of you, first of all, for this uh, opportunity to be at the CSIS, sharing s some of my thoughts on uh, India's growth story. Uh, you know, India's growth story often gets looked up, looked at uh, with different kind of eyes. Uh, there are people who will tell you that uh, India is a fantastic growth story and everything is hunky-dory and it's, it will become the third largest economy in the world in, by 2030 or 2040 or whatever that year is. There are also people who will tell you like the Reuters report that it is uh, stalling. It is also a question of, uh, I think, what we look at. We look at numbers or we look at activities, or we look at the spirit of what's happening over there. So what I hope to bring to you uh, for the next 15, 20 minutes <clears throat> is uh, what's been happening in India, let's say, over the last 20 years, and more importantly, in the last uh, two, three years. And um, where is India going? And uh, what we, at least some of us, want to achieve uh, uh, want to see India achieve uh, in the near future and in the long-term uh, future. Let me start with uh, uh, the story that began in 1991. I often actually say that India is a country which is just about 22 years old. And uh, we must judge that country on its 22-year performance mm -hmm. and um, not on a 5,000-year performance. Uh, <clears throat> because what happened prior to 1991 was that between 1947 when India got independence and 1991 when economic liberalization was announced, we were, as you all know, we were a completely closed economy. Um, nothing could come in and nothing could go out, uh, which really means even technologies and innovation and ideas and, you know, so if you're a closed country, you're not going to be highly innovative or highly creative. And we had huge import barriers, uh, yeah, import tariffs, uh, both uh, tariff and non-tariff barriers, and nothing could come uh, into India. And I still remember, if you, if you wanted to buy a car, of which we had a choice of two uh, cars or two models, both of which were some 1940 or 1950 vintage, we had to wait for about three, four years to buy a car. If you want a, wanted a gas connection in your house, you probably waited for a year. If you wanted a telephone connection, you waited for maybe two or three years. But if you wanted to make a telephone call, you probably waited for three, four hours before you could reach the other person. So these are the conditions uh, prior to 1991. So it is not surprising that by 1991 or thereabouts, uh, India became bankrupt. And the World Bank and the IMF actually forced us to uh, liberalize. And I still remember the comment made by the then Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narasimha Rao, 
uh, 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 I think it was a U.S. journalist who asked the question that, Mr. Prime Minister, you have been extraordinarily courageous. You know, how did you, uh, how did you take the courage uh, to liberalize your economy almost overnight? To which the, our Prime Minister Narasimha Rao said that it's actually quite easy because when you have uh, no choices left, decisions are extremely easy. <laughs> So that's how the liberalization of India uh, was announced. And if you were to look at a scorecard, if I may were to use the word scorecard, for what India has achieved in the last 22 years, it runs somewhat like this. <clears throat> the, the GDP of India uh, grew by something like five times between 1991 and 2011. And in the previous 20 years, it grew twice and in the this 20 years post uh, liberalization the gdp of india grew something like five times and it is now a more than a trillion dollar economy some of the other statistics but i thought i should give some of these positive stat statistics before we get down into some of the problems the per capita income uh, grew by 400 percent in the last 20 years and in the previous 20 years, it grew by something like 40 percent. The household savings increased by 12 times in the last 20 years. The foreign direct investment increased by 250 times. Of course, albeit from a very small base because by in 1991 we had nothing coming. But it's still an impressive number. For foreign exchange reserves grew something like 30 times. Exports increased by 15 times. And in 1991, we had, uh, for a population of about a billion people, we had 500,000 telephone connections. Today, the number of telephone connections probably close to a billion, or maybe 900 million or so. And we are adding something like 15 to 18 million subscribers every month, which is higher than the population of sort of many countries of the world. We no longer wait for uh, buying a new car. It's there off the shelf. We no longer wait for many things. So what India has achieved over the last uh, uh, 20 years uh, is indeed impressive if you look at it, India as a country which is 20 years old. Because if you are not in a competitive arena, if you are not in exposed to the world, uh, then I'm not even sure whether uh, you can count those years as relevant to a country. India, of course, has had a rich tradition for spanning many, many years. And often we Indians uh, love to spend time in the past. And I think uh, slowly we are spending a little more time in the present and future than only in the past. So this is the story of the last 20 years since uh, liberalization. And if you look at this 20 years, from 1991 to, say, about 2000 or so, about eight, nine years, India grew at a rate of about 5%, 5.5%, 5 .5%, 4 .5, around 5%. Prior to 1991, for that 44 long years, between 1947 and 1991, India grew between 3 and 4%, what we used to call as the Hindu rate of growth. That sort of has got up to about 5, 5.5%. And post-2000, once the reforms were settling in, even though we still have to do a large number of reforms yet to be done, but whatever we had done during those uh, eight, nine years resulted in a plus nine percent growth successively for four, five years. Even during the 2008-2009 global uh, financial crisis and global economic crisis, India actually clocked a GDP growth rate of 6.4 percent during 2008-9. Then it got up to 8.6 percent. But the last two years, as some of the reports point out, it is indeed a fact that India has slowed down a bit. The growth rate in 2011-12 was 6.9%, and the growth rate in 2012-13 was further down at 5%. And it has caused an enormous amount of uh, worry. Part of the reason is politics. Part of the reason is, uh, is uh, global economy. But I, I, for one, believe that India's dependence on global, every economy, of course, is connected to the world economy. There is no question about it. For example, India exports a fairly large percentage of its exports to the to Europe and European economy being what it is today, India's exports have, have got affected. But I do believe that uh, India is such a large domestic market that India's economy for the current times at least 
need not be so uh, much dependent on global economy and it could have actually done much better if we had a better, shall we say, political cohesion uh, among the various parties that, that run the uh, government today. So the last two years have, have, uh, have not been extremely uh, good for India and it is in the light of this scenario that the budget of 2013-14 was presented. <clears throat> and when the budget was presented 2013-14, the government uh, was weak, the government was vulnerable. We have had uh, several uh, problems in India, uh, including some scams and, you know, telecom uh, mess and mining mess and, you know, land acquisition problems. It is in the midst of all that this budget was presented. And this budget is a budget just immediately preceding a general election next year. So it had to take care of many, many factors. It had to take care of the fact that uh, our fiscal uh, fiscal shape of India is a bit fragile. We are having a higher amount of fiscal deficit and revenues of it deficit than what we can afford, than what we can live with. Inflation over the last two, three years have been high. Inflation often has touched double digit figures. It's running at eight, nine percent now. And uh, we have had a slowdown in the economy. The investment growths have slowed down. Uh, the interest rate have been raising. The Reserve Bank of India has been raising interest rate for several uh, quarters by now. Uh, till till uh, the last one was a decrease by 25 basis points. But till then, for almost 13 quarters successively, the interest rates have been going up. So it is in this backdrop uh, that the budget was being presented. And I believe that the budget had three uh, prime uh, motives, three prime issues uh, to deal with. Uh, the first issue to, is, is that uh, uh, the, the fiscal uh, problems of the government has to be, has to be addressed. Uh, fiscal consolidation needs to start. And we have just got too much of fiscal deficit and too much of revenue deficit for the health of the country. So that is the first issue that needed to be addressed. The second issue that needed to be addressed was, in India, the growth in the last uh, 20 years post-liberalization has been healthy and robust, and it has kept on increasing. And in spite of the global meltdown, we have had good growth rates, but they have fallen down to 6.9% and now 5% last year. So we, there is a need to revive growth. <coughs> we must appreciate that in India, every year, every year, something like 10 to 12 million people get into the job market. 10 to 12 million people get into the job market. And in order to ensure that these uh, 10 to 12 million are productively employed, which is almost 800,000, 900,000 jobs every month, and uh, in order to ensure that all these people, all these youngsters get uh, uh, jobs and productive jobs and are useful to the country, uh, we need to make sure that India grows economically. At the GDP growth rate has got to be about at least 8 to 9 percent. If that doesn't happen, uh, and adding some other issues that are social in nature, which probably I will touch upon a little bit later, you can have, uh, you can have some social unrest cropping up at various places. If the unemployment goes, you know, skew, you know, goes very, goes very high, so that's another worry. So the first issue to be addressed in the in the budget was the fiscal consolidation, make sure that the numbers are okay, make sure that the plan is okay, so that we bring down the fiscal deficit. The second is to revive growth, and the third and a very important one for India is is that it's not sufficient if India just grows by eight or nine percent. That's not enough. I'm not talking merely numbers here. Even if you grow at 10 to 12 percent, it will not be enough unless you have, uh, you have uh, equal opportunities to everybody and unless the growth is inclusive. The growth so far has not been inclusive and the growth has not been inclusive for two, uh, two reasons. Uh, primarily, uh, the reason has been for many, many centuries in India, we have had this uh, caste system of uh, who will do what type of work. And that has sort of got ingrained into Indian's mind and one is not able to get out of that mind so easily in such a short period of time of 20, 30 years. The second, of course, is the oncoming of industrialization. The industrialization is actually, by its very nature, unless you carefully address it, 
will lead and has led to uh, inequality of opportunities. And both these factors, and probably the, in India, the first factor of, uh, you know, centuries-old caste system has played a bigger part in, uh, in this inequality of opportunities. So there is a, more than probably any other country in the world, uh, India's uh, uh, need for uh, uh, inclusive growth is much greater. If we just grow economically and put the money into fewer hands of, uh, of the population, it's not going to be so good as, uh, as putting lesser amount of, uh, shall we say, fortunes, a lesser amount of money in a larger number of people. Uh, India is one country where this is going to play a, a very big part. In fact, I am of the view <clears throat> that uh, uh, if I were to choose between a very high growth rate, which is not inclusive, and uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, having a slightly lower growth rate, but far more inclusive, I will choose the second one. And sometimes we, uh, the, uh, the, developed, the more developed world, uh, does not, I think, easily see the social issues of India as being the more important uh, issue to be resolved or an equally important issue to be resolved ec along with economic issues. If you solve only economic issues, India is not going to be a great country. If you solve the social issues along with economic countries, I think India will be a, a fantastic country. So these are the three priorities uh, of the government uh, in terms of formulating the budget of 2013-14. One is to get the physical uh, numbers proper, physical consolidation, journey of physical consolidation to start. The second is to revive the economy. And the third is to ensure that that economic growth is an inclusive one and not uh, the way it has happened so far. And still we are not in an inclusive uh, growth uh, phase as much as we would desire. So if you see the budget, uh, it, has, it, has, uh, it, it is a budget which has been formulated under these constraints. It is a budget which has also been getting form was formulated or was announced or was read out in the parliament under the current global economic conditions. If you see the budget, there are just a few highlights of the budget that I want to talk about. One is there is, uh, in terms of fiscal consolidation, last year, 2012-13, uh, we ended with a fiscal deficit of 5.2%, uh, and uh, which I think is lower than what we had originally thought the number would be at the start of the year, looking at revenue, uh, you know, collections and uh, and the receipts and the expenditure and so on and so forth. And for the year, the plan has been made in such a way that the, for the year 2013-14, we will bring it down to 4.8%. And if you are able to stick to it, and I think that's a good good uh, sort of journey forward. Uh, in terms of revenue uh, deficit, again, which was unbearably high, we have contained last year 2012-13 at 3.9 percent, and we are aiming to do a 3.3 percent fiscal deficit uh, in the year 2013-14, which also, in my view, a very positive step towards acknowledging the fact that, uh, you know, that, that, that we can't keep on widening the deficit and it's not going to be good for the health of the nation. In terms of reviving growth, uh, the budget has announced a number of measures. For example, in India, given its population of uh, 1.2, 1.3 billion, and, uh, and given its uh, current uh, growth uh, status so in, the, in the hierarchy of growth, uh, manufacturing has to occupy an extremely <coughs> important part. Today in India, manufacturing contributes about 15 to 16 percent of the GDP. Whereas if you look at countries like China, China is close to 35 percent. Uh, Th Thailand is close to 40 percent. And, uh, and the United States and uh, Europe, at their heights of uh, economic growth, also had more than 25 percent of their turnover, of their GDP coming from manufacturing. In fact, I don't know of any country in the world with a huge population to be uh, effectively engaged in productive activities uh, without you know, having grown economically prosperous without going through a solid phase of manufacturing growth. In India, it has not happened. And in India, at best, we have now reached a, a, a contribution of 16% of the GDP coming from manufacturing. And our own thought, the, the thought of the government is very rightly 
to reach a level of at least 25 percent in the next coming uh, 10 years. And this budget has recognized that. For example, this budget has given a what is called the uh, introduced an investment allowance. If you invest so much uh, above a certain number, you get a 15 percent, uh, uh, you know, tax deductible uh, expenditure. So, and uh, we are also talking about uh, we have evolved. Uh, the government announced a new manufacturing policy a few months ago, sometime last year. The government announced a new manufacturing policy, whereby we are going to manuf we are going to create manufacturing clusters at a few locations in India, maybe about a dozen locations in India over time, which will have its own uh, uh, autonomy in terms of what kind of industries will come, what environmental standards, what uh, uh, you know, what type of industries depending on the location of the clusters and so on. And, uh, and the land acquisition process for those uh, uh, manufacturing clusters are going to be made easier. So the country has announced a manufacturing policy. So there are a, a number of uh, uh, small initiatives that have been announced in the budget which will promote manufacturing. Also a number of initiatives that have been announced for the infrastructure area, like for example, creation of a tax-free bond, I think up to 50,000 crores, which is about or $10 billion or so. Uh, we need, of course, much more than that. Creating, there are four uh, debt funds have been created. Some, some more has, is need to be created. We are, plan we are planning two major ports uh, in India uh, with a total capacity of about 100 million tons by, uh, per year, both the ports put together. So there are a number of measures on the revival of the growth. I talked about fiscal consolidation, where government has pruned certain expenditures. But of course, one is not entirely happy that what has been cut is a planned expenditure on the capital account. The What is called the non-planned expenditure, which is the subsidies and the wage bills and all, have not been cut as much as we would desire to cut. But we would also know that it is the election year and we are facing an election within one year from the announcement of the budget. So we, we take that into account and we see the intentions of the government to go forward. We have, in fact, in the area of subsidies, which you may call as a part of inclusive growth, but it's not necessarily a good way to go about long-term inclusive growth. There are other better ways of doing that. Our uh, subsidies on uh, fertilizers have gone up. Uh, certainly, f subsidies on food has gone up. But what we have succeeded in doing it is to cap this or reduce the subsidies on uh, fuel, uh, on petrol and the, the gasoline and the and the diesel and so on. Over the last six months, if you see, the government of India has taken some very bold moves, very bold decisions on the price of diesel and the price of petrol. And I I see that journey uh, going forward. I also see a time in the not too distant future where it will become market oriented. So we will start beginning. I think. The era of uh, subsidy reduction has just started in India, where people have realized that there is no way in which you can give subsidies. Also, the subsidies are getting better directed to the to the uh, uh, appropriate recipients, better than what it used to be before, in terms of what is called the direct cash transfer to the uh, the beneficiaries and so on. So the budget has been formulated in this context, and the budget has actually got. Uh, uh, very good positives from a point of view of fiscal consolidation or starting of the fiscal consolidation and uh, and reviving the economic growth and we do believe that this year the economic growth should be closer to 5% than what it was last year which was which is about uh, closer to 6% compared to last year which is about 5% and if we are if if we have a good stable government uh, in the next uh, year in the next elections and if we have cohesion of the parties, I do see a lot more uh, sort of bolder moves. In fact, let me uh, also tell you that <laughs> it's my perception that perhaps the government has taken more bold moves in the last six months than what they have been able to do in the previous, uh, shall we say, four years of their tenure. And which is, a, which is a good sign that in spite of everything, uh, they have taken these bold steps like the FDI in retail, and uh, we are beginning to talk about the f foreign direct, you know, increasing the foreign direct investment in defense uh, areas and so on. So these are all uh, very good moves. So much about the budget. 
the the uh, in substance what i would talk about the budget is this has been a very uh, responsible budget uh, it is also a budget which is just one year before the elections so in practical terms you really uh, however uh, you know well you may wish that much more reform oriented uh, budget needs to be presented it's not going to be practical because everyone loves their seat and you know all that is is an important thing now coming to elections i <clears throat> um, i need to be a little bit careful here i i don't want to be drawn into a controversy of who which party i'm i'm supporting mm -hmm. so I, let me be let me ch choose my words a little bit carefully mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know we have elections every five years and in india elections are very major uh, major issue and it also i think uh, to the credit of india it's one of the most well conducted elections anywhere around the world without any controversies without too much of controversies without too much of problems there are people who believe that this government has not performed well uh, i for one believe that if you were to take into account the state of the global economy that global economy in the rest of the world excepting china and india was almost flat or declining and india has, has its own problems impact of the global economy on india i am not entirely sure whether the government could have done too much more compared to what they have done but i do know that it is more a more a analytical approach rather than a public approach where the public would see what results this government has achieved so so that's one point and uh, definitely there are lots of forces in india uh, which are trying to blame the government for inaction for several uh, for several years for several months and years and there has been a lot of criticism by the western press on the on the indian government's inaction including the one that the ambassador read out just now but i for one believe that in the context that exist at any given point of time mm -hmm. in the global economic conditions and the fact that the fiscal deficits have gone up because of the fact that there was stimulus that had to be given by the government for uh, you know keeping up the industrialization pace or keeping up the gdp growth phase 3 4 years back and we are, we still have the overhang of that uh, stimulus package weighing on our fiscal deficits and revenue deficits i think the government has done a, a good job and i think government has done a reasonable job of uh, what they should be doing of course the elections is anybody's guess uh, i maybe uh, during the question answer session you can ask me about something specific and i can talk about it but i am don't want to make any predictions but i do believe that a, a, a continuance of a certain regime is a very good thing for a country and and i believe that in these difficult times it is necessary for continuity of leadership and a continuity of uh, the thought process and continuity of philosophy for a complex country like uh, india with that i will stop and i will be happy to take any questions <clears throat> i accept the right time okay um excellent remarks a great great way to start off our discussion i'd like to um just pick up on a couple of points that our speaker has raised i had not heard the reference before to the last six months uh, of reform measures in India being more than the previous four years. Um, and I'm reminded that when um, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh spoke to the nation, uh, as these <coughs> new measures were announced and his new finance minister, Mr. Chinandran, was on board, that um, he said something in his remarks. He said, I'm not willing to go down without a fight. And I thought, you know, that's the the old Manmohan Singh from his days as the finance minister. Um, so I found that to be very encouraging uh, and very consistent with what you have just said. I'd like to ask to start off, and then we will open this up, on the three issues that you mentioned, um, fiscal consolidation, revival of growth, and equal opportunities for everyone and inclusive, and something that you said that I think is extremely important in understanding uh, India's national policies, that the social issues are as important as the economic issues. I'd like to ask you, in terms of equal opportunity and inclusiveness, where do women fit in? Uh, 
what is being done in your view to bring women more into the mainstream of the economic workplace to provide them the kinds of opportunities um, that um, uh, would assist uh, both obviously with equal opportunities but also would as assist greatly in the revival of growth. Where do you see um, the broad policies for women in the, uh, in the workplace and education and the rest? You know, um, I don't know how many of you are aware that the Indian Parliament passed a bill um, recently reserving certain seats in the Parliament for women. Mm -hmm. uh, that I think is a good step, but I believe that whether it is the women um, empowerment or any other, uh, any other uh, bringing social equality to any other sections of the society, the issue is far more uh, fundamental in the sense that I, for one, believe that merely by diktat or merely by government passing laws or government reserving certain percentage to certain sections of the population, uh, I don't think that is the un uh, that's a good answer. A good answer is actually uh, from a cultural, from from an in, in, inner self, that this is the right thing to do, and therefore you are doing it. And whether it is for women or whether it is for for that any sections of the society, for example, I believe that you need to do it because of the fact that you have not done it well for hundreds of years or thousands of years, and you need to do the right thing which is what industry is doing in India, in terms of what, what we call it as the affirmative action, mm -hmm. uh, which is a term which is uh, sort of borrowed from the United States. And in fact, the term that I would like to use is giving due share, you know, which is <laughs> sounds to me a little more appropriate term. So I industry in India has taken on a conscious move. Uh, uh, in, in fact, the Confederation of Indian Industry, the Conf the the Associem and the FIKI and every one of those organizations, we have co run programs in our own respective companies to give preference in terms of, uh, say, providing scholarships to people who need scholarships, to provide uh, uh, skills for people, to, so that they they are brought up to a level of enabling themselves to get equal opportunities in their livelihood, uh, in earning their livelihood. In terms of women, I don't think there are any specific programs by any corporates or individuals. In fact, the first woman director in Tata Steel was appointed six months ago mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in, a, in a company which is more than 100 years old. We, we have the first woman director just a few months ago. So that I believe that consciousness is spreading and I believe actions are being taken, including in the government where certain uh, reservations are being made for women, including in the parliament. So actions are going on, but I think this is not going to get solved, uh, you know, in short period of time. It's going to take a longer time, and just like it is for women, it is for some other uh, sections of the society which have been denied equal opportunity for several thousands of years in India, where we want to take actually actions, even some positive discrimination we want to do, where we say if there are two people who are equal in every respect, you give, give preference to somebody who has been denied that right for many years. Mm -hmm. As many companies are doing uh, you know, positive discrimination also. Good. Okay, uh, I'd like you to please. There is one comment yes. uh, I wanted to make. Uh, <clears throat> since you mentioned Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh, he was at the CIA uh, annual general meeting uh, in uh, early this month. And uh, <clears throat> he made a remark, uh, he made a wonderful speech. The last time he was at the AGM of CIA was in 2007. And he was coming to address CIA after f six years. <clears throat> he said that uh, he reminded us about what he told us in 2007. And in 2007, he said, and this was before the f global financial crisis, and the mood was upbeat in the industry. And everybody said that the world is moving so well and so fast and so smoothly that everything is going to be fantastic. And he warned us at that time saying that, look, please don't have this euphoria that world is moving in great shape. You don't know what is going to lie ahead of you. You need to tighten your belts and improve your efficiencies, etc., etc., etc. That's what he said in 2007. 
when the mood in the world was completely upbeat. And now in 2013, he said that, look, I now see a situation where all of you are glum and you think that world has no future and you think that 5% is going to go down to 3% and 2% and no growth and, you know, stumbling and so on. But I want to tell you that things are not as bad as <laughs> what you think you are. Because you people have a tendency to uh, sort of inflate something which is on a high and deflate something which is on a low, and you need to be careful of that approach, <clears throat> which I think is, is, is got a point there, having proved one's right. Yeah, please. I, I, I wish that we had read those speeches ourselves in 2007 <laughs> and today as well. So I'm going to ask you to identify yourself and your affiliation, and we'll just start right here. <clears throat> Hi, thanks for joining us. My name's Gretchen Phillips. Uh, I had a question on your two pillars. You talked about uh, inclusivity and you talked about growth. And I was curious to hear a little bit around how you see rural India. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of focus on rural versus urban, but what are the changes we need to see in rural India to achieve those two objectives and how you think the budget uh, addresses some of those needed shifts? Uh, you know, as I said, inclusive growth is fundamental to India. And, and we should not forget the huge impact that that will have, uh, both negative and positive, if, if, we, if we don't do this correctly or if we do it rightly. And uh, the way it is getting addressed now is by the government has programs and also the corporates have their own programs of, for example, upskilling people. We, 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 the country has taken on, and it is still not enough. Uh, in a country where there is unemployment, if you go to some major construction sites or major project sites, you will find that they are not able to get skilled people easily. Even now, there is actually a shortage of skilled people. Uh, there is no shortage of uh, PhDs or uh, you know the doctorates or you know highly qualified uh, management professionals and so on. There is not too much of shortage in that arena. As much there is a shortage on the basic skill, people with skills to do, you know, welding and cutting and plumbing and so on and so forth. And that is important when you're building a nation. So the government has a big program of skill development. And this year, in this budget, the skill development, uh, of much more money has been provided for skill development than in the earlier budgets. And much more money has been provided for education than for skill uh, the, than in the earlier years, and also uh, the bank loans. For example, if somebody wants to uh, study MBA, Master of Business Administration, he can go to a bank and you know he can get a loan quite easily for his studies. But if somebody wants to learn welding, he doesn't get a loan. So the government has eased the loan mechanisms for skill development uh, schemes also. So there are measures where uh, we, we, are, we are very conscious of that inclusive growth thing, and government has taken measures on this. And including, they are, the government is telling the industry associations, for example, we, in our own companies, skill people beyond the requirements of our own, beyond the requirements, uh, far beyond the requirements, uh, because we feel it is a responsibility and the government alone cannot do it. It's voluntary and many of our companies do it. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Abhishek. I work at the World Bank uh, in rural development. Um, I want to ask you specifically about a policy that the government passed a few years ago for the uh, public sector units. Uh, you know, uh, it's often that private sector gets uh, uh, not, uh, gets blamed or gets uh, criticized for not doing inclusive growth or not re uh, trying to reach the rural poor especially. So the, uh, the government had recently passed that uh, law uh, or, or a diktat for public sector units to spend 1%, I think it's 1% of their um, um, profits on uh, uh, CSR activities and rural activities. Um, is that policy in whatever you've seen is that being effective? If and if it's being effective, is it um, should the government give a directive more incentives like that for the private sector? Expand that to not as a diktat, but as more as a uh, opportunity. Let, let me let me give you my views on the subject, and I do hold some strong views on this subject. You know, many some years ago, in uh, I think it was ninety three or ninety two or ninety three, when the India had just 
uh, economic liberalization had just announced by the current Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. The, the then Prime Minister was Mr. Narasimha Rao. And he had called a meeting of top industrialists of the country in Delhi to tell them that they should spend at least 1% of their net profits on society. In fact, Mr. Ratan Tata attended that meeting and my boss, uh, I was not the CEO at that time, my predecessor also attended that meeting. They did not know what we were spending at that time. So my boss came back to office after he stripped from Delhi and he said that, look, you guys, you, you, have you ever calculated what is the percentage of net profit that we spend on society? We said, no, we have never thought about it in those terms, but let us do a calculation. So we did a calculation between 1990 and that year in which that meeting took place, I mean, previous 10 years, 1980 to 1992, some 10, 12 years. And Tata Steel had spent between 8% and 13% of its net profit on, on corporate social responsibility during those years. The, the reason for 8 and 13 being widely divergent is because the, the, uh, the numerator was the same, or more or less the same, irrespective of what the denominator was, denominator being the profit. And that varied depending on the cyclicality of the steel business and so on. The point I'm saying is many of our companies I've been doing this without being asked to do so or without having any government diktat. And I personally believe that that is the right way to go about it. Today, you have, we have a situation in the, com in the, in the uh, latest company bill, company law uh, bill, the government is stipulating 2% of the profit to be spent on corporate social responsibility. My view is that that money is not to be spent after profits that money is part and parcel of the operations of a company and profits come after that. So I have a fundamental <laughs> disagreement on that. For example, the, the government has stipulated it and we had not liked it very much. And the government has said, okay, it's a guideline and so on. But what happens is some of these uh, diktats of the government can get actually misused uh, if it is not intended well. But supposing you had another, uh, another way of doing it, and you said that, look, I want, to, uh, I want to incentivize companies which do good work. You will find a different kind of, uh, different kind of behavior. Because the, often, uh, you know, uh, you behave on the base of what you get measured. And if you are measuring companies on the base of profitability or market capitalization, they will only chase that. But if you are measuring companies on the basis of total returns to the society and other metrics which include the societal performance of a company, the company will behave differently. And there are companies like the Tata Group which have behaved like this irrespective of what the law has been and even if there are no laws. So my own view is that the government should not mandate that, maybe have a guideline, but the companies must do it. And we must propagate this thought to the, to the, to the companies and even incentivize companies uh, into behaving in that manner. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Henning Speck from the German Embassy. Um, and thanks, uh, Rick, for referring to the latest round of government consultations that, uh, um, that the German government had with the Indians just last week, which uh, took Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and uh, I believe a decent portion of his cabinet to Berlin and the meetings were very productive, among others. Um, um, the, the question of skills development featured very prominently in the, in the discussions um, where uh, we both uh, found ground to um, work together very closely to work out from both ends as well as um, technology cooperation. Um, I have one question uh, concerning the three main challenges that you raised before. I believe that in order to um, revive growth sustainably as you, um, as you hinted at, um, the question of energy supply is crucial um, also to um, generate the inclusive growth at the end of the day. So the question is, um, given the scenes we saw last year with uh, longer energy shortages, uh, how do you, um, especially coming from a, an energy intensive um, industry, envisage a medium term energy strategy for, for India and how do you assess um, the policy of the government, the latest pass in that regard? Energy is important uh, for India, there's no question because of 
huge population and the growth uh, that is taking place. And we are short of energy. And a large part of our energy uh, uh, production is uh, thermal, uh, because India has got lots of coal, and therefore there's a lot of uh, production uh, from uh, coal. And in India, coal is dom coal production is dominated by a government company called Coal India, which is in the public sector, which doesn't operate very efficiently. And with the result that we always have perennial shortages of coal compared to what, what the power plants actually require. And India, in spite of having so much, so many billion tons of coal uh, in, in its deposit, is actually having to import thermal coal from Indonesia and you know uh, Australia and many other places. So the government's policy has, has been, in fact, in the recent, very recent past, I would say in the last one year, there have been lots of controversies about how a power project needs to be won, you know, how, a, how, how, how they had to be bidded out. Is it going to be on the tariff or is it going to be on the through cost with fluctuating coal prices, international coal prices, people have, we, we have had a problem. And the government had set up a committee <coughs> to resolve those issues, and those issues are still to be resolved. In the meanwhile, government is also giving incentives for solar. Solar energy is coming up in a big way in India. Uh, government is giving incentive to wind, uh, uh, wind power, which is also coming up fairly well in India. So these are the, you know, in terms of energy, India needs to uh, solve the current uh, problem, which I th hope it will get solved very soon. And uh, much of the energy uh, requirement of India will be met through thermal sources because of the fact that India has got coal. Th that is a more economical route for the current. But at the same time, there is a lot of incentives that is going for both wind power as well as solar. That's a mix that we are going to have. And your point, the first point that you talked about, the comment that you made on the skill thing, <clears throat> in fact, uh, Germany is one of those countries which has got a very highly developed uh, skill development program, uh, exceedingly good skill development program, and that's the reason why we are having conversation with the, with the German uh, companies and with the, with the German government on the subject. Do, do you see opportunities for the United States and India to collaborate on skills development? Yeah. I do see that, and I was, in fact, mentioning it at lunchtime to uh, a gentleman whom I met, that uh, m many of these countries, the United States, Germany, and many of these countries, which have, over a period of time, developed very good uh, infrastructure and systems for skill development, actually can participate with the Indian companies and Indian government for this process. It's a very, very important process. And the amount of skill development that is required in India is enormous. Uh, enormous. So it's not one country is going to solve our skill development problem. There are opportunities, to my mind, for many countries. Yeah. This is something that um, the Wadwadi Foundation is very deeply involved in already. So this is this is a yeah. great area of collaboration. Yeah. Question here. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I'm Terry Otis. I, uh, I'm a consultant to several defense companies, ITT, Excellus, and others. I'd like to ask, uh, India is engaged on a very ambitious uh, defense modernization program. What part of the economic development do you think that will play, and how much should it or should it not play in the overall development? Are you talking about private sector involvement, or, or what exactly is it? Well, I think India will require private sector involvement in any of major programs, and so we're working through ways to try to make that happen. Uh, it does involve skills, it does involve investment, and it also involves uh, getting approval to transfer technology. So um, uh, it remains to be seen how it's all going to play out. Yeah. Uh, no, it's an important question. India's defense uh, requirements are high. And while this year's budget has seen a reduction in uh, defense budget, actually, in the, in, the, in the current budget, I'm quite sure the, in the near future it's going to increase. Uh, and the India's defense requirements are huge, and India does not have the technology, except in a few public sector undertakings and a very few uh, private sector undertakings. And the government of India has always been a little bit reluctant into opening up the defense sector to private sector in India. <clears throat> and uh, I do believe that he, he, there is a big opportunity for, um, for foreign uh, expert companies to come to India 
uh, to do business in the defense area, to establish facilities and so on. Indian government also has got a very good offset program. I'm sure you are aware of it. That uh, if if there is a if if there is a buy of uh, equipments, and a certain percentage of that needs to be manufactured in India, it is to it is to uh, sort of encourage uh, defense production. Defense is an area which is uh, extremely uh, sort of important from a point of view of getting overseas technology and overseas equipment. And here is an area of, again for the United States to participate in in India, in India's growth. <coughs> Do you think that there's reports that the um, Indian government is going to raise the FDI cap on defense? Do you think yeah. it's going to go up to 49%? I, yeah, I think so. We are we from the CI has been extre have been extremely supportive of that, and we have been saying to the to the government that look, you don't have to worry. Uh, you know, let's take it up to 49%. Otherwise, you will not get people. It's 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 something which we have been batting for. And then Mark. You have very appropriately mentioned about the infrastructure. And as you know, India's finance minister has been make, t undertaking roadshows to attract foreign investment in India. In tomorrow or day after, he's going to be in Washington and going to be in New York and Boston for inviting, especially US venture capitalists to come to India. But there are certain reservations among them. I have been meeting some of the CEOs, and they feel that India is not still completely open or transparent so far as they are. So what are your possibility or uh, projections about, because India has tremendous, tremendous future and opportunities for infrastructure development, and American companies can definitely participate in that project. Thank you. No, you are right. Actually, India's uh, needs for infrastructure is huge, huge. Even, uh, you know, if you had not traveled in, to India, say, in the last five years, and if you are undertaking a visit of just only after five years, you will see some very major changes in infrastructure development in India. Most of the airports in India are new compared to what you saw five years ago and so on and so forth. And I'm not seeing, uh, I, I know the issues involved. I'm not seeing too many American companies in the infrastructure area in India, probably because of uh, land acquisition problems, probably because of, uh, you know, counter guarantee. You know, there is always, a, the, the moment you talk about infrastructure, government is involved, and then you expect a guarantee from them, and the guarantees will not be forthcoming, and risk cannot be taken only by the guy, you know, who is who's coming there and not by the Indian government. These are the problems. But I would only ask the uh, U.S. companies, to, uh, to, to understand the complexity of India. It is not that, uh, for example, you take a company like Tata's. We, are our, we have got our uh, ethical systems, we have got our governance systems. We would not do anything you know, uh, beyond a line. We would do everything right, but we have succeeded. Uh, perhaps there is a patience that is associated with uh, doing business in India. And perhaps one needs to get used to getting a little bit better patience. I, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> well, well said. Well said. Uh, Mark? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for coming, sir, and Rick, for putting this down uh, in the white line chair. Um, Need your affiliation, Mark. And that's why I think you see such a robust discussion here. Um, the question I have ties into a couple previous questions um, on offsets, but also skills development. One of the initiatives that the Wadwani uh, Foundation and my boss have been working on is community colleges in India. So again, those skills training institutes that are not, it's not IIT, and it's not the private colleges, but it's community colleges. And I think uh, Ramesh Wadwani is working on an initiative that's going to build 200 colleges in the next year. But one of the issues is funding. Um, and so one of the questions I have is when I talk to U.S. companies, I think they'd be very interested in funding some of these community colleges for skills training. 
But there's currently not a vehicle for them to invest. And so we talk about caps on foreign direct investment, but specifically um, to the question I think Mr. Otis raised about defense offsets, that right now the offsets market is essentially saturated in India. So specifically, if you take the Boeing deal with the C-17s for $4 billion, they're having a very hard time finding a place to put the money. So is there any thought about revising the offsets policy? It could be in one method where you'd have a two-tier system. The first tier would be a defense company like HAL. But if there was no money to be able to, or if there was not a destination for the money, that you could have a second tier, which would have colleges, NGOs, other areas where India needs the investment that allow the U.S. companies to invest and also strengthen that partnership. Is there any discussion of that? Yeah, you, you're right, and, and there is discussion on that subject going on. In fact, it, your, your point is very valid, because today's offset policy is very restrictive, uh, and it doesn't allow you, uh, because all said and done, what, what, is, what India is expecting is money is to be spent on things that it needs. And it needs many other things apart from what is uh, strictly contained in that uh, offset thing. So, uh, in fact, again, CI is uh, one of those institutions which is telling the government, saying that please revise your offset policy. And there is a there is a conversation that is going on, and we are hoping that this offset policy will get revised. That's question one. Uh, the, the the earlier one that you talked about the uh, vehicle for uh, <clears throat> the uh, the community colleges, you know. Uh, CII can, uh, Sandhya, you're here, and I think you should go and meet the gentleman. Uh, one is one approach is to uh, is to approach the Confederation of Indian Industry as to how they can f facilitate this process. The second is we have a National Skill Development Corporation, which can uh, do a joint venture with anybody, and you can approach the National Skill Development Corporation, and I am willing to talk to the National Skill Development Corporation when I go back, if I, if I sort of take your contact details, I will send you a message back. There are vehicles. I, I do know <clears throat> that in this uh, complex embryo of things, uh, to get it to the right uh, uh, person or a right uh, institutions, which can be used as a vehicle, is, is a complex process in India. I, I, I must admit that. But I think there are ways of doing it, and CI is, uh, would be happy and willing to sort of play that role. <clears throat> yeah. um, growth. Well, no one talks about growth. In, sorry, my name is Geert van Velde, and I represent an NGO that works in very backward uh, villages in India. And when, uh, whenever I hear growth in India, uh, I think well, from what I see, where, where uh, we are working, I don't see it. So it, it, could it be that uh, India, one India grows at 15 percent, and the other <clears throat> yes, that is correct. Where have you been? <clears throat> I, I can understand where he has been. <laughs> no, you see, if you just look at very broadly, India as being north, south, and east, west, the, uh, if India w was growing at, on an average of 6%, you will find the south and the west would probably be growing at 12%. And even in that south and the west, you'll find Gujarat growing a little higher than that percent, and states like Karnataka and Tamil Nadu also growing at about 10, 11 percent. That's the story of the west and the south. The north will probably a little bit lower, uh, maybe six and a half, seven percent, but the east will probably be two percent or three percent. The eastern part of the country has not been growing, uh, and I suspect that's where some of your work has been there. Or yeah, rural areas. No, no, you are. Yeah. <clears throat> in the rural areas, I agree. Gurugaon is a completely different place today compared to what it was even 10 years ago. But Cannot imagine. But, yeah, 100 miles away from uh, Gurugaon, the story is a little bit different. I agree with you. Which is why I'm talking about inclusive growth. We need to get the growth. Uh, impacted, you know, people of the rural areas get impacted by it. I agree. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, Mike Delaney, Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. 
we, given that there, there seems to be a consensus that India has to increase its manufacturing sector relative to the size of its overall population in order to achieve its economic development goals. That, that Everyone seems to agree on that. And it, right now it's around 15, 16 percent, something like that. What, in your view, would be the right policies for India to increase uh, the share of manufacturing in its economy? Thank you. You see, you need, um, I think, three, four things. One is you need a much faster land acquisition process because all manufacturing is going to require f some fresh land. So land acquisition process need to be made much simpler than what it is in India today because it often takes about three, four years to acquire some piece of land. Second is the cost of land needs to be reasonable and affordable by the industry. The industry cannot be competitive if, if you've got you know, price of land equal to the price of land at which you'll build a house or something like that. So that is the second one. The third is, you know, industries uh, 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 sort of spring up in clusters. Associated industries come up in clusters. So it is necessary to create conscious, planned uh, clusters of industry, manufacturing industries. And you need to earmark uh, in fact, I, I am of the view that the government needs to earmark lands for these clusters. Government needs to acquire these lands for upfront and give it to people, uh, in, in fact, overnight, uh, you know, develop the land and give it and charge for whatever is to be charged, rather than let each company go and, you know, acquire land which takes about five, four, five years. If these three, four things are solved, you don't require great amount of incentives and so on. The land acquisition, the land cost, formation of clusters, I think will aid manufacturing in a, in a big way. Um, we have another answer to that question, if I could give that, from Montauk Singh Alawalia. Yeah. If you happen to see the Economic Times just two days ago, he, he also is focused on this, this question. He said, Lack of consensus, poor coordination among the stakeholders, and antiquated labor laws are holding up implementation of the national manufacturing policy one and a half years after its introduction. Miffed at the delay. He's miffed. That's what he is. He's miffed. He has written to all the chief ministers, asking them to hasten implementation of the policy that aims to increase India's share of manufacturing to GDP from 16% to 25% and create the 100 million jobs that you mentioned. So uh, at least at that level, they're on the case. So the gentleman in the back. Okay, thank you very much. Very uh, my name is Liu Zongyi from Shanghai Institute for International Studies. Uh, now I'm a visiting fellow in CSIS. I have uh, two questions. The first one is that uh, in recent years, we can find in uh, India there is a political uh, decentralization. It means uh, uh, some regional uh, political parties become more and more powerful. So, and uh, on, one, on one side, these political parties uh, uh, blocked the, the reform uh, measures uh, adopted by the central government. Uh, and on the, on the other side, it encouraged their economic development in, the, in, in, their, in their own region, such as in Gujarat. Uh, in other regions. So I, I would like uh, to know how do you think about this phenomenon? VRH encourages the economic development or block the economic development in India. And uh, my second question is, uh, is a private, uh, is a private uh, question uh, about the election. If there, there, uh, if there are only two candidates, one is uh, Modi from Gujarat and one is uh, Lahore Gandhi, who were you? Who 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 were your sports? <laughs> Thank you. Why don't you focus on number one? The 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 answer to the second question is easy. That I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Incidentally, I was at the Shanghai Institute of uh, International Studies two years ago. Uh, I I went and spent half a day there. I have great admiration for that institute. You know, the answer to that first question is this issue of democracy. And uh, while 
over the last, if you see the last uh, 25, 30 years, uh, we have had debates on socialism and free market capitalism and I think the last century was a triumph of free market capitalism till I think the year 2008 arrived. So every political system also is going to be questioned uh, all the time. But at least I am of the view that mankind has not yet found a better uh, system than democracy with all its ills. So some of the problems that you are explaining, uh, I'm sure are familiar uh, uh, with people in the United States also. Uh, probably it's more complex in India because it is a, shall we say, a younger democracy of only 22, 23 years old. And in a democracy, you cannot help having these kind of things. The, the essence of leadership in a democracy is to wade through all this and still be able to perform and still be able to deliver what you want to deliver. And uh, I know what you're saying, that there are parties which support uh, growth in certain parts of the states in which they may be in power, and they may be against it when center government wants to do it. This is the political process of a democracy. And if you can find a better uh, form of government other than democracy, I would be happy to listen to it. But I don't think just now we have a better form. <laughs> Um, you notice I've gone around the table. We're saving the last question unless <laughs> others of you want to add one. For the, the, save the last for the best. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, sir. Uh, you had a great uh, views. I was fortunate to meet Mr. Ratan Tata. His views were for India to end E and D, end poverty in India and bring cars to every Indian household. One, how the government was helpful in his dream for the common and mass Indians. And second, of course, the World Bank and IMF meetings are going to take place on Wednesday, and U.S. economy is at the low. And finally, what do you think uh, these meetings here will bring for India, or what India should tell the world? Because the World Bank IMF meeting also, their logo is END, and poverty and global challenges. Thank you, sir. No, your question is so widespread. I don't know where to focus. Uh, you know, there is, uh, there is, there is no question. Uh, f first, on the car project, you know, we can't be depending on uh, for everything on government. Uh, that's that's not correct. In fact, I am of the view that, you know, if you look at the last uh, five, six hundred years of human civilization you would have had religious leadership on top in a certain era of time. Then you would have had military leadership on top in a certain other era. We now have the democratic leadership on top, by and large. And I think slowly, since the, max, since the bulk of the wealth creation of, in every country happens through a private sector, businesses, I think a business needs to take on that leadership know, beyond the religious leadership and the military leadership and the democratic leadership. And I believe it will it'll happen. So you can't be depending on government to do everything. Nano, we wanted to produce because Mr. Tata said that he wants to provide everybody with a car that he can afford, he or she can afford. And we, have, we went about our job of uh, sort of creating that car, designing that car and manufacturing that car. And now that car is being sold and used by people. Uh, as many people as, uh, as, as, they, as they need. In terms of the other issue that you raise on the World Bank and IMF and so on and so forth, it is true. You know, look, as I mentioned, India is on a certain path. It is not strictly or only on economic glory path. If that is the case, then you would only do that and you will not bother about inclusive growth, you will not bother, and you can, you know, suppress the social unrest and so on. That's not the way we want. We are a democracy. We will have problems. It will take some time, but we need to be directionally correct. We need to be directionally correct not only for economic growth, but also for social growth. Bringing happiness to a larger and larger number of cross-section of people must be the aim of society. Just creating wealth should cannot be the aim of society by itself. That's the point that I would say. 
Well, um, I should mention, if any of you watch Fareed Sakaria GPS on Sunday, um, yesterday he did a really fascinating interview with Ratan Tata. And um, you can go online and see it. Don't have to watch it on Sunday. And he talked about the role of social responsibility um, in the corporate world. Uh, it really was quite, quite frankly, inspirational. So I urge you to click on to CNN and Fareed Zakaria. I'd like to uh, end with one final question, because I was really interested in what you said, that India is a country of 22 years, not 5,000, um, going back to the reforms and what's occurred. Uh, in terms of the U.S.-India relationship, uh, we're a teenager. Uh, we're 13 years, um, going back 66 years to independence and recognition. Um, we really have started a new relationship over the last 13 years. I'd like to get your sense of where this 13-year relationship uh, is and where you think it could go. The, I think uh, in 13 years, you know, forgetting the history of the past and so on and what stop, sort of stopped us from getting closer to each other, I think 13 years the relationship has grown quite well. There has been far more exchanges, far more listening to each other, for more understanding, you know, more number of people have, uh, more number of very senior people from the from from the U.S. have gone to India, made visits in the last 13 years than ever before. So I think the this engagement level is a, is a good engagement level. The point that I always keep saying is, India and U.S. Uh, to me are natural partners in many ways. Uh, both are democracies, uh, both are you know, freedom-loving people, both are expressive people. Uh, the language is common between the two countries. And for all those uh, positive, given those positives, uh, I always feel that this process needs a little bit pacing up, a little bit speeding up. And whatever one can do to uh, make that uh, speeding up process, uh, one would like to do. <clears throat> when you return to New Delhi, please take that does touch on many of the issues that we have been discussing this afternoon. And finally, I want to thank our distinguished speaker. Uh, we thought, what could we give him as a small token of appreciation? Um, and we went through the list of paperweight, coffee cup, umbrella, <laughs> decided you probably have enough of those. So we went out and we got you something which our, our intelligence folks told us that you would really like to have. and I'll share this with you. You can open it up here. No, I can see what it is. But uh, No, actually you can't. It is lovely. golf balls, but from where? Ah, lovely. The White House. <laughs> or at least a White House gift store. <laughs> but nevertheless, we well, understand that much. he's a great golfer. Thank you so much. You know, talking of golf reminds me something. I'll just take half a, less than half a minute. Yesterday I was watching the Masters uh, along with my grandson who is six years old, five and a half years old. Yeah. And he knows that I play golf because I gifted him with a small uh, golf set, sm small set which, which he can putt. So he asked me, Grandpa, are you a serious golfer? Are you a, are you a real golfer? So I said, yeah. But why do you ask that question? No, no, what I'm asking is, are you a real, real golfer? So I said, yeah, I think I'm a real golfer. <laughs> No, but do you play this Masters? <laughs> so, said, so that was the end of the conversation. So. <laughs> that was a great tournament yesterday, wasn't it?